This is the Drill Sergeant with another nugget of gold for Fiery Trials. Creating jewels for the Kingdom of God. This is Sister Barbara and I'm coming to you today with a character study. And I was sitting here and Gideon came to mind. I'm going to be sharing with you Gideon, the sword of the Lord. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Hebrews 11 and 32. When Gideon first appears on the biblical scene, he seems to be the most unlikely of heroic characters. In fact, he first comes to us as a poor, frustrated farm boy suffering from a total lack of self-esteem. His homeland is in ruins and under siege by a powerful militarized nation. He is discouraged and despondent because of the sad state of affairs around him. Poverty and hunger rule the land and Gideon's people, God's people. The children of Israel are hiding like frightened animals in caves and dens in the rocks. Israel's dilemma Gideon was threshing wheat by a wine press to hide from the Midianites. Israel's enemies found in Judges 6 and 11. We see the depth of despair that overshadowed the land, for the regular threshing floors of Israel could not be used because of the constant bands of foraging Midianites who stole everything Israel produced. The wine pressed at Ophrah was safe for Israel and had no grapes left. Besides, the Midianites would never suspect wheat was being threshed there. What a portrait of forlorn hopelessness. Once mighty Israel, descendants of Abraham with the military traditions of Joshua and Caleb in their history, are now quaking in their sandals and hiding their meager sustenance from idol-worshipping foreigners. Now this state of nationalistic trauma was not without reason. Like individuals, nations get into trouble when sin lies at the door. Judges 6 and 1 tells precisely the reason Israel was in this state. The scripture says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Drill sword judge. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Median seven years. Further, God had sent a prophet who reminded them that God was the one who delivered them out of Egypt and gave them the land of Canaan. He told them to never fear the idol gods of their enemies. Through this prophet, God told Israel what their sin was. But you have not obeyed my voice. That's verse 10. How many of you know that sounds like today? I'm going to say it again. But you have not obeyed my voice. Disobedience. The diabolical sin behind all sins 
had done in Israel. The wrath of the Lord had fallen like a flood of waters. And the people felt the chastisement, which is the correction, of a God who loved them enough to turn their hearts back towards Him. Their cry of despair in verse 7 brought the message of the prophet to them. In verse 11, God began a miraculous deliverance through His encounter with the poor farm boy named Gideon. Now what were Gideon's qualities? First it says he was humble. The first thing you notice in the life of Gideon is his total humility before God. Not before man, but before God. What we find today is too many of us pretending to be humble before man. And God is looking at your heart. God is analyzing your ways. An angel appeared to him as he threshed wheat by the wine press at Ophrah and told him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That's found in verse 12. Gideon looked at his own rags at the leanness of his ribs and his hidden wheat and asked the angel a reasonable question. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Verse 13. As I was reading this, I guess you could see why this touched my heart. It sounds just like today. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? He was prayerful. He also asked, where were all the miracles that his ancestors talked about? And why would God bring them from Egypt to deliver them to an equally cruel enemy like the Median? The innocent are often victimized by the sins of those around them. And so it was with Gideon. His heart was pure and his questions sincere. Others had brought the judgment of God on the land. Yet he and the innocents like him were suffering with the disobedient. God answered Gideon, through the angel by telling them to go and save Israel. For God said, Have I not sent thee? How many of you have been sent? And you haven't went. <laughs> oh, and you haven't gone to do what God has called you to do. Verse 14. Gideon's humility coupled with his low self-esteem suddenly comes forth. Gideon asks the angel a question. Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Verse 15. No ego is involved here. There is no arrogance. Unfortunately, a characteristic of some great religious leaders. He actually tells God that he, Gideon, is probably the wrong choice. How many of you have told God, Lord, I don't think I'm the one. I, I don't think I'm supposed to do that. But God responds to humility. And God loves the humble. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and you shall smite the Midianites as one man. Verse 16. In addition to his humility, we find in Gideon a young man who wanted to be sure of his actions. There is no rashness in Gideon. He asks 
of an angel a sign from the Lord to show if he was found favor in God's sight. Gideon brought the meat of a sacrificial goat together with the broth and some unleavened cakes of bread. The next thing he was, he was willing. This was a great sacrifice from a hungry family, but God's favor was more important to Gideon than earthly fare. The angel then instructed Gideon to place his sacrifice on a rock. And as the angel touched the sacrifice with his staff, fire rose up out of the rock and consumed the sacrifice. Instantly the angel disappeared from Gideon's sight. A symbolic lesson in spiritual living can be found in Gideon's sacrifice and the happenings here. When one brings his or her best to God, and places it on the solid rock, Christ Jesus. When one is then breathed upon by the fire of the Holy Spirit, whatever is brought becomes an acceptable offering to the Lord. Just as Gideon's sacrifice was accepted. Gideon named the place Jehovah Shalom, verse 24 which means the Lord our peace. An altar to God was built to commemorate the place where God began his deliverance for his people. Next we find he was proactive. He didn't sit and wait on nobody like all of y'all. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. You already have your instructions. He got up. He decided to be active, proactive, not waiting for something to happen, but to make something happen. Realizing that only complete devotion to God would bring deliverance from the Midianites, Gideon obeyed God's command to tear down Baal's altars and cut down the groves of trees they had dedicated to idol gods, verse 25 through 32. Since disobedience got Israel into this place of destitution, Gideon would do nothing except what God commanded. Now we have to be careful here because so many people are running out doing what they command or what somebody else has commanded to do, them to do and not what God commanded them to do. In fact, Gideon may be one of the most cautious men in scripture. His cautious nature was not due to a lack of courage but rather to a complete and full desire to be obedient and pleasing to God. Are you being pleasing to God? I, I truly want to be pleasing to God. About this time the Midianites, the Amalekites, and all of the children of the east converged on the valley of Jezreel, verse 33. The Bible says that the invading armies were like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude, verse 7 and 12. This was a frightening sight for Israel, a military mobilization threatening them like this one looming on the horizon meant nothing less than the forthcoming of annihilation of Israel. He was spirit led. In the midst of this frightening development, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet, verse 6 and 34. Quickly, the people of Abizar Manasseh, Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali gathered together to follow Gideon into battle. Approximately 32,000 people responded to the trumpet call for help. This number represented a considerable army. 
they bivouacked at a place called the well of Herod. Seven and one verse. The word Herod, H-A-R-O-D, means trembling. They gathered together at the well of trembling, which was an apt description of most of Gideon's army. Once again, Gideon, in cautious manner, tested the Lord to be sure of his favor. He placed a fleece of wool on the ground and asked God to let the morning dew be upon the fleece only and the ground around it to be dry. If indeed God is going to use him to deliver Israel. On the following morning, Gideon was able to wring a bowl of water from the thoroughly wet fleece and the ground was dry. Then Gideon asked God to prove himself one more time. This time the fleece would be dry and the ground was to be wet with dew. God did exactly as Gideon asked. Verse 6, 35 through 40. One begins to wonder how long God will tolerate this kind of bold behavior. But we must realize that this behavior was inspired more by cautious faith than it was by doubt. Gideon believed God, yet he had to lead people into battle who doubted themselves and who had been disobedient to God for years. These tests were so contrary to natural laws that no one could doubt that God was with Gideon. God's Methods Now the testing of Gideon began. God had proven himself. Now Gideon would have to prove himself. This is always true in God's dealing with us. God provides the power, but we are the instruments of that power. Drill Sergeant. God provides the power, but we are the instruments of that power. In Judges 7, 2, and 3, God told Gideon that his army was too large. What you think about that? Too large. God knew the nature of the people. So he told Gideon, the people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Let Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So God is saying it was too many of the children of Israel. And so it would look as though they did it of their own strength and not by the power of God. So God tells them, you got too many with you. God's test for these people was very simple. He instructed Gideon to simply tell all who were afraid to go home. How many of you know that a lot of times you have stuff to do for the Lord? And you got a whole lot of people carrying weight along with them because they are too afraid to do what God has told them to do. Drill sergeant. They're too afraid to do what God has called them to do. 22,000, more than two-thirds of his army left. And that's something. 32,000 left immediately. All of them were scared. Perhaps a lot could be said about cowardice here. But the chief concern of this story should be commitment. Are you committed to the Father? Are you committed to your calling? Are you committed to your assignment? that God has given you. 
To be afraid is a trait of human nature. But commitment overcomes cowardice. 22,000 just didn't have enough commitment for the battle. Nor did they have the commitment to receive victory. Drill sergeant. Nor did they have the commitment to receive the victory. How many of you today know God is trying to give you the victory over some things and you are so afraid you don't have the commitment to receive the victory. My, my, my. Reception takes commitment too. For in receiving, we assume responsibility for what we have received. I'm going to say that again. Reception takes commitment too. For in receiving, we assume responsibility for what we have received. This mass exodus of uncommitted cowards left Gideon with 10,000 troops. God tells him, the number is still too great for the Lord's miracle. No one would receive glory for this victory but God. How many of you know that if you look into somebody else to help you get the victory, you're wasting your time. Because God will not allow anyone else to receive his glory for your victory. No matter what you're waiting for God for healing. Healing from sickness. Healing from the mind. Healing over your finances. Healing over your relationships. You're praying and sometimes we run to too many people. Do you have an answer to the left? Do you have an answer to the right? Do you have an answer in the front of me? Is there an answer behind me? Instead of seeking the Lord who's waiting to give you the victory over your trouble. The Lord told Gideon to take them to the water. And he would try them for Gideon. He would separate his army. I want you to know that God is in the process always of separating his army. There's a lot of fake folks in what would be assumed as the army of the Lord. But God said, I will try them. God's method was simple. Those who lapped water like a dog were put in a separate group. Those who knelt and drank were placed in another group. The final number showed 300 men who lapped like a dog and 9,700 who knelt on their knees to drink. Now you would think that God would make another decision, but because in our eyes we judge differently than what God judges. Who would just lap like a dog? Shouldn't we bend over and place our hands down and do it appropriately? Well, let me tell you something about our God. He chose the 300. He said, by the 300 men that lapped, I will save you. Verse 7. See, we don't know how God feels. We can't answer for God. We don't know how God looks at things. Some have tried to spiritualize this test, seeing character traits in lapping or in kneeling. But it makes better sense to understand that God knows what is in every man's heart. I'm going to say that again. God knows what is in every man's heart. You don't know what's in my heart. You can only judge me and try to pile guilt on me. 
because I don't kneel like you kneel, but because I lap like I lap. God knew each and every person in the army and knew which 300 of the original 32,000 he could trust to carry out his plan. Why? He made them laugh as a dog. Only God knows. But be that as it may, he did choose his army and pronounce them as Israel's deliverers. Vital elements. Gideon and his servant, Fura would perform one more act before they went into battle. That night, they entered the camp of Midian at God's command and listened. How many of you all have the ability to listen? The word of God said, he that has an ear, let him hear. God is always talking. God is always trying to tell us things. But we are so busy sometimes, we just won't listen. Here we pause and realize the value of listening. Our propensity to talk more than listen often hampers our spiritual journeys with God. The old adage that God gave us two ears and one mouth so we would listen twice as much as we talk is apropos for most of us. That night, Gideon and Phura heard two Midianite soldiers talking. See verse 9 through 15. One related a dream he had to his friend. He told of seeing a huge cake of barley bread roll off the hill and obliterate the host of Midian. His partner told him, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the hosts. Verse 14. The Bible says that when Gideon heard this, he worshiped the Lord. Verse 15. Who can blame him to hear this kind of confirmation from one's enemy? Was an extreme faith booster. Let me help you understand. The man that had the dream was on the enemy's side. And the man that interpreted the end, the end of the dream was on the enemy's side. And so God told him, listen, listen. The Bible says when Gideon heard this, he worshipped. He worshipped. He received confirmation of what he was supposed to do from the enemy. Sometimes you need to listen and see what your enemies are saying. Gideon's battle plan was simplistic. But it was powerfully symbolic of God's power. He divided his army into three companies of 100 men. Each man was given a torch or lamp, which was then placed in a clay pitcher where it would smolder but remain hot. Each man was given a trumpet. They surrounded the camp of Midian. When Gideon blew his trumpet, all of them were to follow his example. You know how hard it is to get all of anybody to do anything? I see why God broke it down to just 300. They were supposed to break their pitchers and the resulting inrush of oxygen would cause the torches to flare into flames of fire. With a loud voice, all would shout, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon, verse 16 through 18. Imagine in the darkest hour of the night, 
301 torches blazed, 301 torches blared, and 301 voices of faith and victory cried in unison, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Complete victory. I'm going to say that again. Complete victory. I feel that in my spirit again. Complete Woo! victory. Complete victory. The effect was cataclysmic. The Midianites ran in all directions. How many of you know that God plans for the enemies to run before you in all directions? And Israel slew them to the borders of their homeland. They even slew their kings, Oreb and Zeb, verse 25. Notice the spiritual symbolism in Gideon's victory. A torch was kept lit until it was time to shine. God will keep a torch lit inside of you until it's your time to shine. A trumpet of victory was blown to announce the battle. And God's sword was declared to be the first weapon in battle. Naturally, the people decided that Gideon should rule in Israel. He had rallied the people and had led the victory. In verse 8 and 22, the Bible says, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Gideon's answer to them is a classic in Scripture. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Judges 8 and 23. I know so many people that would have grabbed that position so fast. They would have put their nose up in the air. I said, now you're going to obey me. But Gideon retained his humility. After the great victory, the recognition of God's rulership is paramount in a character of greatness. God is sovereign. And only those who recognize this fact can ever be truly great. Jenny Wilson wrote something that said, Time, and we've sung this before, time is filled with swift transition. Nothing of earth unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God, unchanging hands. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Father, we thank you for the character of Gideon. Father, we thank you for his humility. Father, we thank you for his obedience. Father, we thank you for his love of you. Father, we thank you that today we pray this word will pierce the darkness, pierce the heart of someone who you have asked to go and they are afraid. Let them know, O oh God, that you are with them, that you never leave them, and that you will never forsake them. 
And God, I thank you today that you are answering all of our prayers. And we bow before you right now in thanksgiving and praise. And we honor your name for it is worthy. It is worthy. And we will hold to your unchanging hand. This is Gideon, the sword of the Lord. And I am the drill sergeant with another word and a nugget for fiery trials. Creating jewels for the kingdom of God. Be blessed in everything the Lord has commanded you to do. God bless you. Pastor Barbara.